I'd like to just welcome everybody. It really gives me a pleasure to see you all here, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to be with you and to benefit from some of the things uh, that we're all going to hear from our panelists, and I'm sure from many of you. Uh, my name is Susan Johnson. I'm the president of the American Foreign Service Association. I am a career foreign service officer now in the Senior Foreign Service. I've been in this career about 30 years. And I'm also uh, a third culture kid because my father was a career diplomat, so I grew up all over the world. Um, but before, before we got that nice little moniker, so we weren't, I guess, known as third culture kids back then. World has changed a lot, but probably a lot of the things that we, um, I don't know, characterize or epitomize or go through or face or whatever are pretty constant despite the change of global situation. So again, uh, a warm welcome to all of you and a welcome to our wonderful panelists. I'm really delighted to have all of you here. Um, and let me start just with some introductions at the far end there. Uh, Julia Simons, an author, educator, consultant, presenter, with a focus on international relocation. And this has kept Julia coming and going to and from the U.S. for over 20 years. She's worked on five continents uh, with families who are relocating. Um, she has a focus on family therapy and early childhood education. And she's currently an elementary school counselor in Bangkok, Thailand, and is the author of Emotional Resiliency in the Expat Child. And I think I saw a few copies of that over there, so if any of you are interested. Um, then we have uh, Rebecca Odin. She's been involved in international education since 1970, uh, first as a TCK, then as a teacher working in Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Oman, Lebanon, and Uruguay. Uh, Rebecca has a master's degree in curriculum design and experiential instruction from Prescott College, where her thesis topic looked at meeting the transitional needs of TCKs in international schools, so very relevant to many of us. Uh, in addition to many years of classroom teaching, she's coordinated programs to deliver instructional strategies to teachers and develop English language learning systems in schools. Uh, then we have uh, Rebecca Grappo, uh, I guess another Foreign Service uh, offspring. Uh, um, she has a master's in education and is a certified educational planner. She's the founder of RNG International Educational Consultants. She works with third country kids around the world and is a frequent presenter on the topic of global mobility and its impact on kids. Rebecca also does placements on boarding for boarding schools, uh, boarding schools for learning disabilities, therapeutic schools, and works with students on college applications. So as a serial uh, expat who's married to a career diplomat, she's lived in 11 countries and also raised her own kids uh, around the world. So now um, I'm going to turn to the uh, uh, most interesting part of all of this. And I'm basically just to let you know, I have three or four sort of basic questions that we're going to be asking each. Oh, I forget. You didn't finish. <laughs> and that's, I can't do that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Why is Becky sort of pointing at me? <laughs> the other, Rebecca, Rebecca Becky Grappo. Uh, is, is pointing out to me that Ruth Van Recken is the person that I've overlooked, and she is kind of the most recognizable name in the field, so it shows where I've been at, out of touch That's for the last saying, 30 years. That's what I'm saying, it's not very true. She's, she wrote that up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one of you, both of you. Um, she's the co-author uh, with the late David Pollock of the seminal book, um, Third Culture Kids, Growing Up Among Worlds. And uh, this may be Becky again, but... Um, Ruth, apparently you're a legend. <laughs> so. No, we'll take it. We'll take it as a good source. Um, Ruth still writes and lectures around the world on topics of third culture kids and cross-cultural kids, and she is going to be sharing with us some of her insights on why some um, TCKs thrive in the global lifestyle while others struggle with it. So, my pleasure to have all of you, and now what we're going to do is uh, have all of our um, panelists uh, address sort of three basic questions, and then we're going to move to Q&A. And I'll say it now, and I'll repeat it again when we get there. Um, for those of you who have questions, please do come up to the mic here. And you know, if you're in the middle of a row, just excuse yourself and do it. And 
We, we need you to do that. We have about 20 clothes around the world who've already asked us to please send recordings. And in order to pick up the audio and make sure that our recording really captures everything in the discussion, it's important for you to go to the mic. So I'll thank you for that. So let me start in now with kind of the first uh, question. And I don't know, maybe I'll start at the other end so I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that question is, what are the factors and variables that seem to make a difference? Maybe if you'll start and spend a few moments on that, and then we'll ask each of you to address it from your own perspective. <coughs> okay, I'm going to speak more from the personal aspect. Um, since I'm not an educator, I'm a cheerleader for families who are in global transition. Uh, the thing I think first everybody has to remember is the K is for kids. Kids are kids, even if they're third culture kids. And so the things that are important for every child, to have a strong family, to have that place of being nurtured, that place of feeling significant, that place of belonging, is important uh, for third culture kids, uh, those who grow up you know, among many cultural worlds as well as for anybody else. And so part of what we'll talk about later is how do we foster that. I think another thing that's a variable, of course, is the child's personality and their particular gifts. And the great mystery is people say, well, why is it in the same family some kids thrive and some kids don't thrive? And there's no one size fits all, but if you have a really super creative kid, I don't know if the others would verify that, but it seems to me some of these kids really struggle uh, a little bit more than some others because they have such terrific gifting, but it doesn't fit in a box that keeps changing so much. They don't always have, uh, whoever they are doesn't fit in a box anyway, probably, and so when they're on the move and they're in a system that kind of moves up a lot, they have to figure out a way to catch up, or the parents have to figure out a way to deal with that, and uh, certainly the educational system and how the schools do it. But I, I think the biggest thing that I would like to say is this is a normal experience for those who do it. And we need to normalize what are the realities of this lifestyle. What happens when a child grows up among many cultural worlds instead of the way traditionally people have grown up you know, in one monocultural situation? And what are some of the benefits and the challenges? And if we start to see that, I think the biggest thing I do for adult TCKs when they've spent their life trying to figure out what's the matter with me is to say nothing, actually. You are normal for the experience you've had, and that's part of, you know, I think the strategy for parents is how do we deal with the, the challenges of the saying goodbye and, and all that so that it becomes, in fact, our gift in the end. And uh, I think that those are some of the variables to me, you know, the family, uh, the child's personality, uh, whether the parents and the school system understand the story, and they're going to talk a lot about why it's so important for the schools to understand the story, too. <coughs> and if the organization if the Foreign Service, do they have a good support system for the families? Because when all those things are working together, uh, I've seen you know some terrific examples, and I'm sure many of you out here, how many of you out here grew up among many different worlds? See, you're right here using your story. So that, that gives me evidence that uh, there's a lot of resilience. That's my beginning. So, um, well, when I think about some of the factors and variables that make a difference, I think we have to go back to what are the core needs of all human beings that, according to the research and what we know about um, the formation of identity. And I think the core values are, first of all, a feeling of belonging, a feeling of being recognized for who you are, and also a feeling of connection wherever you are. So if we think about belonging, connection, and recognition, we realize that when kids are moving around the world, this is kind of a moving target. How can you belong if you don't know where you are, where you're going next? So it's important for us to help them have a sense of belonging. That recognition means being recognized for who you are. And of course, they're always recognized within the family, we hope. You know, that's another family systems question that we could talk about all day. But also, when they go to a new school, are they being recognized for who they are? And it's also not only transitioning overseas, but coming back to the United States. Are they being recognized for who they are? I remember my daughter in eighth grade came home one day, and she said, don't they know who I am? And I said, no, honey, they don't. And so, yeah. But anyway, um, and then the third thing is connection, that feeling that you belong. You belong somewhere. 
and that you connect with the other people around you. And so I think that's really important. So what are some of the things that can affect those things? I, I want to concentrate my part of the discussion on schools and education because that's my focus um, in the work that I do with kids. And I find that the kids that often feel like they don't connect or belong are the kids that have a different kind of learning profile. So kids that might struggle academically or kids who might be extremely gifted and might find it hard to relate to their peers because they don't really have a peer group or people or kids who have a talent that can't be expressed. Um, sometimes they have a difficult time. Um, if they feel like they're misunderstood, that's going to impact their recognition and their sense of belonging. Uh, we also have kids who are what we call twice exceptional and that they might be very gifted but have a learning disability that gets in the way. And either the giftedness or the learning disability is what gets the recognition but that other side of them doesn't always come through, and then it's a moving target because they haven't been, and especially because this is mostly a foreign service audience, we can talk about the frequency of mobility as well because the teachers are always getting to know them, and sometimes it takes a while and they don't have that continuity always. So I think it's really important for us to also be, also be thinking about how their social emotional needs are going to be met and are being met. And so I, when I think about parents who are calling and saying, think, you know, let's think about schooling for my child, I think we have to, in addition to thinking about the academic needs of their children, think about the social emotional needs and how are those social emotional needs being met so that we can go back to that whole belonging, recognition, connection. Yes, sir. Rebecca, Rebecca, we'll do Becca, we'll go. Okay. We'll try to go so I don't miss one of you. <laughs> For me, there are four areas of, of, of very important variables um, that when, when in a K-12 setting we look at. One is the developmental age of, of the child. Um, I think that there are different challenges and different issues that constantly mob mobile children come across and, and the, the issues change depending on the developmental age that they are. For example, for younger children, it's very, it, I shouldn't say it's very easy, it's easier for parents to facilitate connection, the connection that Becky was talking about, connection and belonging. They can create play dates, the simple thing as bringing kids together and within minutes, you know, it's as if they've known each other their whole lives. Working specifically with middle school and high school students, a different challenge arises, which is no one wants their parent to create a play date when you're 12 years old. It's an embarrassing concept. My daughter would have killed me. However, it, it's an extremely important idea of the connection does not happen automatically. So you do have to find and foster opportunities for those play dates to take place or that the social connections have to be facilitated in some way. Um, by somebody who is more capable than a 12-year-old than walking up and, and often they'll say, in the old days it was so easy because we just walked up said, hi, what's your name? And they were playing. Well, you don't do that in later years. So I think the developmental age becomes a very important um, issue in understanding what new challenges and new obstacles might be facing your child. Um, I think the multiple transitions, the number of transitions, I think that as parents, we believe that they did it just fine before, so they'll do it just fine this time around. Um, we have faith that they'll get through because they always have, but I think that for me, what I've discovered is that all transitions don't seem to be equal. Um, the child who didn't struggle before is struggling this time, could be connected to that developmental age or could be connected to just transition fatigue. This time around, it's just something that they're having a, a more difficult time adjusting to. So the multiple loss of status, the multiple starting over, the multiple um, fragmented identities that need to be put back together again, I think that multiple transitions can exacerbate some underlying um, <laughs> obstacles for students. Family wellness for, for me is, a, is the third of an important variable. How is your family culture situated? Um, crisis begets crisis, stress begets stress. 
Are you doing okay? Are you capable of being the advocate your child needs this time around? Is this move harder for you than the last one was um, in particular? School choice is, is the fourth of those variables for me. It's really important that, that as a parent you're on top of, is this a welcoming school? Is this a school that's knowledgeable about these issues? Does it have a comprehensive program to address these issues? Mm -hmm. So those would be my four variables that I, I think are very important. Hi. I just wanted to make sure you realized I'm an American who's had two kids overseas, and we've been traveling forever with dogs and cats. <laughs> but I've been very, very lucky because the world has actually been like a laboratory for me because I work with very young children and their families. And I think for me the most important thing that I've seen year after year, family after family, is actually the mindset of the little kid that I'm talking about. We all know that if you're pessimistic, you're going to see the whole world that way. If you're optimistic, you're going to see it that way. And for me, that fixed mindset is what makes or breaks how the child relates to their new environment. And a lot of people say that when you're born, that's just the way you are. But as an early childhood educator, if you work with those kids who seem to be so pessimistic and you just show them when their reality is not so dark and so gloomy, you can easily make shifts in how they perceive the world. So for me, the primary focus that we have to do is really work with these young kids as their family starts moving them overseas. And I think one of the easiest ways is we use all those teachable moments. Every time your child is in, involved in a situation, you can point out the pluses of it, um, and then they get that kind of I can attitude. And if you yourself are pretty pessimistic, then you need to little work on that maybe in order to help your family survive the best that they can. For me, resilience doesn't come from one-off situation. It comes from those day-to-day -day situations where you're confronted about whether you're successful or whether you're happy or how you're connecting with people. So for me, resilience really is something that happens every day of our life. And I think for me, if we concentrate on the strengths that people have, they're going to be so much more supportive and strong. Um, and as we all know, as parents, we often pick the negative things. And that's what we concentrate on because we want to build that up and make it better. But if you are working with only strengths in your family or strengths with your young child, you're going to find that they're going to become very resilient and very um, excited about this life that you guys have chosen for them. Thank you all very interesting uh, perspectives on that first question. So let me move to the second one. And that is, uh, what can, and I better use this to lecture him on you and then I'm not doing it. Uh, what can parents, schools, and other charismatic adults do to foster resilience? And Julia's talked about a little bit of that, but maybe we can look into it a little bit more deeply. So we want to start back over here. Okay. Well, in the name of full disclosure, my father was also a third culture kid, and we raised three uh, children in Liberia, and our first granddaughter was born in Ghana. So when I was thinking about this, um, I thought, what was it my parents did right? When you look at the world and listen to what they're saying, identity is the number one issue, I think, where people get stuck and unresolved grief. When I talk to the adults, it's this unresolved grief that's come out in depression and anxiety in different ways, and they don't know what the issues are. So if we come back here in terms of what are we going to do to help, how do we help deal with that right off the bat? I think it's incredibly important, as they've been saying, that we do family identity, but what specifically can we do? One of the things I think that was very important in my family is that my parents built portable traditions things that no matter where we were, we did it. So every single Sunday afternoon, we had family time. I was thinking last night of a memory I haven't remembered forever, but this traditions can be tiny, tiny things. Uh, we were like thousands of years ago doing this, and so we didn't have something as simple as Kool-Aid in Africa. 
I grew up in Nigeria. So my mother would count how many Kool-Aid you needed so we could have Kool-Aid every Sunday and have enough for birthday parties. So every Sunday we did a family activity with Kool-Aid and it was quite really special. But um, <laughs> I would suggest, however, that you choose something that your kids like. We had a lot of great weeks, but my father also liked stamps. And so we spent a lot of time trying to put stamps in straight lines and it was frustrating to death because I really didn't care. And I realized <laughs> as an adult, I don't do straight lines. <laughs> well, poor dad, it's hard, but anyway. But we still had even that memory. They also built family history. When we traveled, we didn't just get on a plane and go. They took time to get off the plane and stop in the cities that we traveled in. And so that was a huge thing because, you know, when we have our families together, and last summer we had 70 people together celebrate my mother's, you know, 92nd birthday, and we stayed family <coughs> because we have a lot of history, we have a lot of tradition that bound us together as this family. So I think that was important. I think that also my father always had a motto. He said, Ruth, unpack your bag and plant your trees. He said, so many people who move never really live because they keep waiting to move again. He said, they think, well, I'm going to be moving in two years, so it doesn't matter. He said, you will lose your whole life if you do that. So he said, unpack your bag, plant your trees. If you don't get to eat on that fruit, somebody will. And I went back nine years after we left Nigeria and went back to visit my house and the trees were there. I thought, how fun to my father's fruit. So that was a part of rootedness. And the other thing, we always came back to the same place when we were on home assignment or leave or whatever you call it. And so that was important. I had a sense that my grandmother's home was my home too, that that was my American side and then I had the African side. And another thing they did was they spoke well of the host culture. We say that we have all this global stuff, but I have been in families, may I say, that speak so badly of where they're living. I think, what kind of global vision are you teaching these kids? And uh, my father would always say, don't you ever ask uh, someone in this culture to do what you wouldn't do yourself. I mean, there was a tremendous sense of respect and, and pureness <clears throat> that uh, I think probably came from his growing up also with children who were not of his culture. They didn't give me pat answers. There's a lot of questions when you grow up in the world's kind of a mixed up place. And I think they really taught us principles that no matter where you are, maybe we don't do something here, not because it's wrong per se, but because we're in a different culture. So we want to respect that culture. But that thing itself, you know, if you're in a different context, you can do it. But there are some things we don't do any place. And that's who we are. And all the research has shown, I think that the kids who know and have strong values no matter where they go, that this defines me. You know, I will be this person no matter which culture I'm in. And so those were helpful. Now, it doesn't mean that I didn't have a dreadful reentry. May I say that? <laughs> they didn't think you can do that without a dreadful. I mean, that's not true. She just told me her daughter's doing great. Good for your daughter. You've done well. And part of hoping that this discussion is so kids can do that. But I think that. Uh, at least it gives you the resilience to get through even when you hit those tough times. It's always hard to follow her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm feeling really intimidated. They got the degrees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's a great combination. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so switching gears. Um, the last time we did this, believe me, I was taking notes. Uh, what she said, and she, you know, my other two panelists said, because I certainly don't know everything and want to take things back to my own family as well. So I'm always learning from my friends and my peers. Um, but let's switch gears again to school. So what difference does the school make? And I think that it, schools are a really important place that can foster resilience. And not being in the right school can also be a huge detrimental factor to the resilience of a child. So thinking about this, I think first of all, teachers are so important. They are the ones on the front lines seeing kids on a daily basis. So if kids are, or teachers are attuned to children and their moods and their needs, they're going to be noticing some differences. And I think that, you know, if I would love to write a book one day called The Boy with His Head on the Desk, because what does that really mean? You know, well, is that depression? Is that anger? Is that a learning disability? Is that I'm really tired? Is that things are going awful at home? What does that really mean? And so there are all kinds of things that I think 
teachers are the ones who can be observing and reporting on what's happening. If I could design international schools the way I would like to see them run, I would have them use one of the models that we see in boarding schools where they have advisors, and the advisors have meetings where they discuss their students. And that's not normally seen in international schools, but it's everyday commonplace expectations in a boarding school. And the advantage of that is that they're reporting what everybody's seeing in the school and seeing if there's some common threads or some disparities so that they can be thinking about a student's um, reaction and adjustment to a particular um, to situation. The other thing is that I think it's very important for us to be thinking about the school culture. So when we think about, you know, I think our default position is to kind of go where everybody else is going. And that can be a wonderful thing, but there are kids who are different, and we have to really think about the fit of the school. And even in some cases, whether or not this is a good move for the child. And that we have to be open, I think, to thinking about maybe this is not the best place for our child to be right now, but it is great for everybody else in the family, so let's think about what are some of the other alternatives. Um, but to me, school culture is extremely important as well. Is this going to be an open, welcoming place? Is there a culture of kindness? Is there bullying? Is bullying tolerated? Or is bullying absolutely not tolerated? Do they have learning support? Do they recognize differences and celebrate differences? Or are they uh, the kind of school that's really great for the kid who's right in the middle, but any outlier is not going to have their needs addressed. So thinking back to the other thing I said, if their needs aren't addressed, that affects their social emotional well-being as well. Um, I think also that it's really important for schools to have school psychologists and, and school counselors on the staff. They play a hugely important role, and I think that it's important for them to also make sure that we have that. And then when we have difficulty, what do we do? And how do we address that in many, many countries um, there is not access to good mental health care nor good psychoeducational evaluations to be able to figure out what is going on. Um, I think that it's very important also for kids to have a portable skill or an interest so that they can plug in wherever they go and again make that connection. And a very good friend of mine who's a psychologist, Dr. Robert Brooks, talks about having islands of competence. So in other words, having something that you can take with you wherever you go that is going to make you feel good about yourself and competent and help you feel recognized um, in not only within the family but also among the people in your community. So much more could be said about that, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues here. Fostering resiliency for me is a is a partnership. It's it's a collaborative effort um, with parents and families with the schools because if you look at the research and you speak with kids they'll tell you that obviously when you take out the societal piece and you take out a first culture piece what they're left with is the culture of their family and the culture of the school before they get into the culture of whatever place they may have landed at that time so for the family I think that an advocacy plan and, and a following through plan of who are we going to be and and how are we going to talk within this family about this move and it's it's a, a lot like what Ruth and Becky were saying but also to begin to look at at the kids in your family and say who are the sensitive ones who where do we rewrite the negative scripts how do we how can we push forward in a positive way with humor and you know when you're not feeling very funny at that particular moment how, maintaining a sense of humor is so difficult in the midst of stress and transition. And yet, if you ask people what was their saving grace, they will often say, oh, my parents were irreverent. They were so, you know, they kept their sense of humor. They allowed us to say, yeah, this is really dark, but, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, open listening, and I know it sounds cliched, except that as a parent, I know that for all that I've told parents, it's important to be open listeners. <laughs> during transition and moves, I myself was not a great open listener. It was more like, la, 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 yeah, I know you're having issues, but so am I. Can't you see that? Um, so it's really tough to just remember that 
that you have to be laxer on your expectations. It's like, what's wrong with you? You were a straight A, B, C, or D student at the last school. Who are you now? And that idea of of being flexible with your own expectations and realizing that that in the midst of transition, um, they're regoing, you know, they're they're undergoing some changes. Um, so adjusting your expectations, open listening, not judging, um, not fixing. If I had a penny for every time my middle schooler or high schooler said, I didn't need the answer, I just needed you to listen. Um, and, and that rewriting of negative scripts and being aware when your own words sound like a negative script that perhaps needs to be looked at. And the second um, advocacy plan that needs to be followed through on is within the school system. Um, schools have an enormous negative or positive effect on the quality of a move, an, an enormous effect. And you, you end up with kids who have had their identities rocked a little bit, and what they will often say is, well, nobody sees me. And it's very difficult to be seen if you can't see yourself. So that reminding them of who they are and what they're connected to. And in the same time that you're imparting the family identity, you're also imparting um, an independence and a self-reliance so that they can go move forward even from your family, um, especially in middle school and high school, where they need that little bit of time to, they need to be exploring a different identity outside of the family culture as well. That's the normal developmental thing for them to be doing. Um, <coughs> And I, think, and I think that schools who foster that connection and take the burden off the child to fit in and have a very embedded curriculum and way of dealing with kids in transition, which I'll get to, I guess, in the next round, because I saw my little son here, <laughs> about early intervention. So I'll hand it over to Julia. Thank you. Again, I want to go back from the family's point of view for me, I think so many families have geographic separations, either due to the work, due to um, even if they're in the same country, due, due to the actual work obligations. And for me, I think the most important thing is that communication, open communication between the parents. And I think for me, one of the ways I talk to parents, I always call it cooperative parenting, because the kids have to understand, if, even if only one parent is there, the voice is of the parents and the action is from the parents, what we're doing, what is best for the family. Because kids um, get very, very confused if they hear different stories. So I always make it very important that parents are saying the same things and their communication is very open to each other and then that <coughs> open communication is presented to the children as a united front. And then I want to talk just a little bit about the community. I think people are at risk, most at risk are the ones that in their heart or in their head they really don't think they're very good at doing anything. So if they can tag on to something that they feel very successful, then it's going to go out there in the community and they're going to be an active part of that school or they're going to be an active part in the play group even. It's that feeling that I can do this, I might be having a little trouble right now, but I can do this, I've been a success before. And I think one of the key things that all global nomads need to do, I call it those, um, photos of pride. And for many of us as moms, we have a refrigerator we throw things on, and that's pride. That's wonderful. But I say we need to bring that pride out into the community with these global nomads. We need to make sure that the school's aware of their other things that they've done that are wonderful. We need to make sure that the community centers or wherever they have um, adults that would sing their praises get the information about the kid. We also need to make sure, of course, all this stuff goes home to the extended family, so these people will talk highly of their certificates they've seen or the photos that they've seen. And for a lot of the families I work with, there's key people that work in their home environment, maybe a driver or a nanny, things like that. And I always say, let those adults brag about your children. The more people that can talk positive about your kids, the more your kids are going to feel great about things. And that sense of belonging and connectedness is what's going to help them move after move. And I think sometimes we don't realize that the families actually will, might break down. And when a family does break down, especially overseas, that's when that wider network of people step into place and make it where 
something that could be very devastating is actually just something that the whole family moves through. So I always end up, when I talk to parents in a large group, I always make sure I say one sentence. And it's strong families build strong kids, and strong families share traditions, and they share family rituals, and they have regular family celebrations. And for me, if you have that strong family thing, and you take it to the community for those other adults who love your children, then your kids are gonna benefit. Uh, the last question that we have here um, for our panelists, and then I'm hoping to hear a lot from the audience, um, how can we identify risk factors so that potential problems are minimized? Okay, well, I want to make a point that it was almost the very goodness of my life that kept me from being able to deal with the challenges, because I felt like to say there were any challenges was uh, denying the good. And so I was fine in high school. I was in the States, my parents were overseas. I was fine in college. It was when I got later on in life that I found there was this place of silent depression that nobody else would see, but I knew and I couldn't understand why it was happening because I had no reason for it. I had this great life and I did have a great life. And so I was uh, 39 before I began to do some journaling, uh, trying to understand this other piece and it wound up being the book Letters Never Sent, which started all of this for me. But that is, I think, a long-term common challenge that people have. From the cross-cultural part, we have the identity, but it's from the mobility part that we have, I think, the losses. It's a chronic cycle of separation and loss. So you have to really think seriously about how are we going to do this. And probably the greatest risk factor I've seen that I didn't have any language for until I was doing my journaling and ways it happened was I realized I was encouraged to death, but I wasn't comforted. And a therapist wrote to Dave Pollock and said that was one of the main things that she saw among the TCKs that she uh, would counsel was that they had not known what comfort was. I went to boarding school at six, and you know I miss my mommy, and everybody's like, "Oh, well, just think about." It. So I'm thinking about it, you know. And uh, you know, some kids don't have any mommy. Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> so you're trying to be happy because you got a mommy somewhere. Um, and you know, what well, don't we say things? Just think about the next place. Just think about. Just think about. Just think about. And even when I did letters, uh, there's a line in there. Why is what I know so often and so out of line with what I feel? And there was one uh, you know, reviewer who said, this destroyed the whole book. She had absolutely no reason to feel the way she did. She had a good life. And I thought, I know that was the problem. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't know how to deal with it. And I think one of the things that's really important, if we think about loss, when we have, anytime you have mobility, you're going through a cycle of transition. You need to know what that normal place is, you know, the involvement and what leading is all about. And how do you leave well? Because so often we don't leave well, and they've probably developed a raft where you, you know, reconcile and then you affirm and you say farewell and you <clears throat> destination. But too often we think ahead and we don't go through the process of properly saying goodbye and not having closure. And then of course for some of your kids they're just ripped out overnight because of a diplomatic thing or a you know political thing. How do you even help them say goodbye later? That is a critical thing so that you can deal with your losses now. And what I want to tell you, if you don't have anything else, grief is a sign of the good, because you do not grieve for what you do not love. If I had not loved Nigeria, I would not have missed it. Right? If I didn't love my parents, I wouldn't have missed them. So it is not a negative. So that's the first thing I would say, is understanding how you deal with grief as it's happening, and it's a normal part of the process, there's ways we do it. We mourn things so we can go on. That's what a funeral does. We can go on. But the other thing is sometimes people shouldn't move, just like Becky said. There are friends of mine who have a child who has some extreme <coughs> disabilities or challenges. And after they've taken him to three or four schools in his first, you know, one or two or three years of, you know, how did your lives go, and different languages, they realize he would not make it if they kept changing his environment. He couldn't do it. Now, they were corporate. So at great loss, financial loss, and perks and all the rest, 
the husband chose to localize. And people say, well, I can't do this and that because, I, you know what, you can't. Sometimes there are kids who can't make it. They have a physical disability or an emotional disability or a learning disability, and that child needs some sort of stability, and that's the way it is. And those friends, they localize, they put their child in school that had the needs, just like Becky said, they chose a school that could meet his needs. The kid's through college, he's got a girlfriend about to get married, and they're off running around again. They're in Dubai now. And so they took that season for a time. And so I think that we have to realize we can make choices. But one of the biggest things, if you don't want your kid to be 39 doing their journaling, is uh, you know, my poor mother got exposed to the world. Um, but anyway, help them through the process and help yourself through the process. Because the reason it's hard for us is because uh, it's a grief for us to, to lose the places that we love. And so we do it together as a family. But do it well, cry well, it's not a thing to cry, and then go on. Well, the, um, the whole idea behind doing this panel is because I work with so many different kinds of kids, and some of the kids that I work with are just superstars, and they're just doing great, and they end up becoming diplomats, and half of the room here is full of the kids who really did great and said, I'm going to keep on doing this, and I want to give my kids this wonderful gift that I had. So clearly there's something wonderful about our lifestyle. But on the other hand, I also work with a lot of kids who aren't doing great. And so, and within the same family. So it's really, this is this question that I grapple with on a daily basis. Why are some kids doing so amazingly well? And why are some kids really not? So my own theory, which is not empirically tested, but my own theory is that it seems to me like the kids who have this sense of self who succeed in school, who feel comfortable, who make friends, who make connections, um, who feel good about the place where they are, are thriving and happy and making the most of the opportunities. But some kids don't move well. Some kids don't make friends easily. Some kids are awkward. Some kids feel more awkward than they need to, but you know, like the highly gifted child that may not find their intellectual peer, and so therefore misfire when they're playing with their playmates. Or the kid who, even though you, as a parent you're doing everything you can to bolster that child's self-esteem and say, it's okay if reading is hard for you, but we love you and you're a great kid. But nevertheless, when that child is sitting in the classroom for six hours a day feeling dumb because their learning needs aren't being addressed, they, they start to grow to feel different. So. Um, what I see in a lot of adolescents is when that crack really starts to show. And so maybe they were already fragile anyway. But then you put them into a situation where their environment is completely different. They don't, their languages have changed, the place has changed, the people and the culture and the food and the sights and the smells, it's all different. And they don't know how to control that world and they don't know how to adapt to that world anymore and they react in different ways. And, you know, a lot of them retreat into video games and solitude. A lot of them can't deal with the outside world, so they turn into an internal world. Some kids act out, and some kids act in. Some just, um, we see a lot of depression. And what does depression look like in kids? Depression doesn't always look like sadness. Depression can be substance use. It can be oppositional behavior. It can be anger. It can be punching out a wall. Anger, can, depression can be putting your head on the desk and not participating. It can be all these different things. And, and so these are the kids that I'm also really worried about. Why are they not doing well and what could we be doing differently for them? I think it also depends on, you know, thinking of the foreign service context of this, the frequency of our moves. The fact that once we arrive, we're already thinking about the next place. We're already getting there. So the kid who already has a hard time making friends is already being told, so where are we going to go next? And they haven't even adjusted where they are yet. I think the other thing is that it depends on where they're going and what's going to happen when they get there. Because, you know, if 230 plus places around the world, so there's some amazing, wonderful places that they can go. And there's some really awful places that they can go to. And, and it's, you know, the environment around them is a hardship environment. The family is under stress. The employee is under a huge amount of stress. We have separated tours now. We've had evacuations. 
They're under threat of terrorism. They have health threats. All these things impact the family, and it impacts the stress in the family. It impacts the child. And so, you know, I'm almost getting a little bit sick of going to all these global things where everybody's happy, 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 what a wonderful experience this is. Sometimes it is. And maybe on the end, looking back in the rearview mirror, it was. But on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of the things that we deal with is not very fun. And so in the, you know, the chaos of transition and packouts and getting your paperwork and settling in and getting your life together, all that also impacts the family and it impacts the child, and especially the most sensitive child. And so many of the kids that I work with who are um, on the kind of fragile side actually are the most sensitive, you know? So they may seem like the most oppositional, hard, you know, angry, but you scratch under the surface and they're the marshmallow kids. They're the ones who are really feeling the impact of this. So, you know, I think there's, so, uh, this is not an easy lifestyle. It's a rewarding one. I raised my own kids like this as well. But I think that there are times when it really does require some soul searching. Is this the best thing for our child at this point in time? And if not, then how are we going to deal with it? Is the whole family going to go back? Are we going to separate and some will and some won't? Are we going to um, have one child? leave in order for the needs to be met and the rest of the family can stay. How are we going to cope with this? So I think you know a lot of the discussion is how we're going to make it work, how we're going to make it work. But sometimes we need to say, we need to really rethink this and how this is going. So anyway, again, great kids, their kids, and even the kids who've struggled. So I work, I've worked with some of the kids who've really, really struggled and gone through a therapeutic experience and now I'm working with them on college and having them read, reading their essays about their journey and what they've learned about themselves is the most amazing, awesome thing in the world. So even the kids who struggle can look back and say, wow, you know, I learned a lot. This was my journey. It's a mixed bag. That's what I think. I think it's a mixed bag. Thanks, Becky. Rebecca. <coughs> well, as a parent and as an educator, I, I would say that Assume nothing has become my motto. Um, when I was younger and when my own parents were taking me around the world and I was a TCK, I assumed everything. <laughs> and I was in situations in schools where they assumed they knew who I was and I assumed I knew what it was all about. And over the years I've realized that that it's that those assumptions that are, are really the, the greatest obstacle because it keeps you from seeing what's real and right in front of your face, whether that's your own child and, and how well they're doing. Um, in some, some instances, it's been how well I was doing within the environment that I was. I thought I was doing, I assumed I was doing well. And I assumed my children were doing well and I assumed the school was doing a bang up job because I was working there. After all, we must know what we're doing. So I think that the, the assumption um, is an important thing to challenge at all times. I think that um, to be as aware and knowledgeable as you can be, to have your little portable skills and the knowledge base, and understand that it's never going to look the same way twice. So to understand how children do develop, so that a lot of things that I thought were, were my, my child being crazy turned out to be middle school. And I even taught middle school. But when it was my own child, I said, you know, what's happening? And so to be aware of the developmental norms and to, to know what is normal and what is, what, is, what is a red flag. And the red flags are often there. We just say, they will adjust. They'll get over it. They'll get through it. Um, in my experience, they might appear to get over it, get through it, and, and, and move on. But as, as Ruth pointed out, it goes someplace. And I think that it's, it's our job as the adults in their lives to be as aware and knowledgeable as possible. And then to take our knowledge and, and of our child and take it into the school arena and let them know. Because I, what I find is, to be on both sides of that fence, often parents don't share their own profiles with us. 
they, they are keeping from us, you know, we find out six months after something, a, a traumatic entry of a child or a transition, that, that in, in, their, in their last place, they were really gregarious and outgoing, and, and we've seen nothing but shyness and introversion. So that's a red flag. You know, how, how did it not progress in the way that, 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 that was recognizable to anyone? So I think as much information as you should, can share with the school about their personality, about their academics, about what to look for. And parents often feel like that's not their business, but it is your business. You're an advocate for your child, and you want the school to carry that advocacy through for you. I think in terms of what the schools can do, they should have a really comprehensive ability to profile your child. As your child comes in, not only should it be the welcoming that a lot of schools have, transition in, transition out, but it should be an ongoing monitoring it, within the classrooms, within the teachers, as Becky pointed out. Teachers should know your children. They should have opportunities, especially when you are only in a school for, for a year or two years or three years, they should have multiple opportunities where kids can connect and belong in retreats, in, in after school activities, in, in areas where their identities can come forward and they can be seen by the community. Um, I think, I think most important for me is that often people talk about transition as being an adjustment. And I think that when TCKs get into this multiple transitioning, that it has just become a state of being. Transition is a straight state of being. You're in the transition and you move and you are in always in some, some stage of that transition. It is not the same as moving to a place, adjusting, incorporating, and then becoming a new identity. This is an ongoing stage, state of being, this transition. And it's important to address that in, in, and understand that so that you can best support them developing that identity that they need um, along the way. Well, I just want to share with you what a typical Monday would be like for me, because I have the best job in the whole wide world. As a school counselor at our school, we have it where every child has access to a counselor. And to do that, the counselor goes into the classroom and teaches. So on a Monday, I would walk into a classroom and I would say, hey, guess what we're going to talk about today? And all the kids would say, uh, emotions? And I'm like, yeah, got it. Yeah. But I'm very, very lucky because by the end of the week, I would have had a lesson plan for over 125-year-olds. So it means I'm impacting that many children on a daily basis. And I love that. And we start with our program as young as four-year-olds. And I, my umbrella is up to eight. But the thing I always do about emotions, for me, the bottom line really is, do emotions make better ethical decisions? And I firmly believe they do. And so if a child understands their own emotions or understands the emotions that's going on in their family, then they're going to be responding and being respectful, but also being honest about what's happening. And I think when kids can understand their own emotions, then those ethical decisions that they have to make about playing with their peers or how they're going to treat their family, or even as they get older, what choices they're going to make in life, that helps um, themselves, but of course it also helps society. So for me, I can never, never speak enough about emotions. And I think the second thing that um, we have to make sure is that the kids have a sense of their family, which I know we've said several different times already. You know, your family has to have something that the kids latch on to. You might be the family that reads, or you might be the family that always um, has angel food cake for birthday parties. You have to have something that the kids latch on to, and they know it's going to be consistent, and it's what you always do. And uh, for many of the families I work with, they've kind of separated and gone off in their own unique ways. And it, to me, it's like, what's the common thread that your family can have? What can you always say that you're going to be doing no matter where you live? And, you know, for some people, it's the simplest thing is, you know, we're all going to be on the internet, but we're going to do it at the same time, and then we're going to shut it off at the same time. I mean, there's lots of ways we can make connections. 
So for again, for me, the risk factors are if you can't understand your own emotions and if you don't have a family identity. For me, I think that um, one of the most important things we have to realize nowadays is that there are no children who are going to be a void of pressure. And part of that is just the way society has gone. Part of it is the things that we make part of their life. And so for me, families have to be aware that no matter what time of the cycle, as Rebecca talks about, that it's possibility that things might either become pathological or they might become wonderful. And as parents, it's our job to have our eyes open and be willing to understand that. And because my background is family therapy, the, the family always is in a cycle, a circular thing. And what happens often is it's not made to run smoothly. So you will have, if you have a family of four, you'll have three thriving and one with a hiccup. Just as soon as the hiccup's over, then someone else will get it. So um, I think that's why a lot of us have gray hair. But <laughs> for me, again, you know, I, I do push the emotions and I'm well aware of it. But I think uh, a lot of times the work I do, especially because of the young kids, I impact their parents because we end up talking a lot about the parents' own emotions too. Thank you all very much. I just heard, I'm sure we all did, I certainly heard wonderful things from each of you that I wish I'd heard you know, 50 years ago, but <laughs> here it is. Um, Ruth, I loved hearing that 39. I think I hit that at maybe 37. So. <laughs> and I loved hearing, Julie, about the, the link between ethics and emotions, because when you think about the basic things like honesty, respect, fairness, responsibility that we look for as humans, those all are connected to emotions. And too often we think about ethics as an intellectual exercise and we don't think about the, you know, the link to basic human, universal human emotions. Anyway, my pleasure now to sort of open the floor to questions. Um, I see uh, Tim Towell arrived late, so you didn't hear all the ground rules, Tim, but one of them is if you have a question, you have to come up to the microphone because we've got clothes around the world who'd like to hear everything. Um, so if you do, please do come to the microphone and put your question. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed the beginning. I'm Timothy Towell, 31 years in the Foreign Service. Am I on the air? <laughs> I hope so. Hello, world. Patrick, um, Tim on the air. Patrick, I'm on the air. Um, and I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I came in the Foreign Service in the Kennedy administration, retired in the Clinton administration. Before that, I was a school teacher for four years while going to graduate school. And here in Washington, I was chairman of the Board of the Lab School of Washington, the best institution in the United States of America <laughs> for learning disabled kids. My son, who's smarter than I am and better looking than I am, is learning this, has learned this ability. Reading his thank you letters and notes to me is like breaking the Chinese code. Uh, and I'd like to apologize to you because I'm going to be a happy, happy person. Not that we shouldn't analyze all the negatives. And maybe it was the post I was sent to. Uh, we started out in Brazil. Brazilians, unlike Anglo-Saxons or whatever we are up here, love children and spoil them, as some of the prudes, like my mother-in-law would say, and hug the bejesus out of them. They love them and they hug them because of that reason. And they hugged them the same way in Paraguay they patted my dog. Why? It's the ambassador's dog. Better pat the freaking dog. <laughs> uh, so that's a twofer. And they love my children to death. Bodyguards are supposed to protect me. Playing with my kids. Gardeners, drivers, people in the consulate, they do that. I, in my opinion, that's good for the kids. We can correct them if they're doing something incorrect. But loving little kids is the responsibility of other human beings and, of course, their parents. Uh, there are a little downsides to that. Uh, Easter Bunny was cooked by the gardener because Easter Bunny was eating the flowers. We had to lie. Never lie to your children. Yes, you do. That's um, me. The bunny died. He went to heaven. He was not eaten by the gardener. Uh, so I think that was a warm, wonderful experience, even though my dear mother-in-law, may she rest in peace, thought they were not disciplined and, you know, this looseness. Uh, we went to Belgium, a stuffy European country. Hey, the kids enjoyed it. They went to look to Holland's an hour away. You see Hans Brinker in the silver skates. You see the windmills. You go to Germany and see castles. You know, 
And I was covering non-European issues, so I could go through five receptions, say hello to the ambassador, do my job in five minutes, and go out the jeweler's door, and be home to read to my kids, hug them, and tuck them into bed, and take them skiing in Switzerland, not out in Whitetail or whatever's out here. So my point is that that is great for the kid. Same in Cuba, where our president and I saved Western civilization by defeating communism. Everybody, <laughs> Cubans love my kids. They hate us imperialists. We're living uh, bad times. I'm against evacuations, and I would rumble with that great diplomat, the Honorable Ron Spire, son of a gun, who was taking everybody out there the instant there was a Tom Tom in the bush. What's the question? There's no question. I'm making a happy, happy point. <laughs> that the danger is when you come back to the United States. Says a little sick, little eighth grader comes home and gets stuffed in a school where all the little girls, and there's nothing nastier than a seventh and eighth grader, with all respect, <laughs> and they're pitching and complaining because they don't like foreigners, and these are outside kids. So the United States and being home is the problem, overseas is not the problem. Well, we can talk about that. <laughs> yes, many of us. Thank you. Um, so, other questions? Hi, I'm Susan St. Rossi. I'm a foreign service spouse. I'm also a clinical social worker and have had a private practice in three of the four countries we've been in since we've been married. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, I, as, as you all were talking, I have a lot of thoughts. I work mostly with uh, adults, but also with families. Uh, just two thoughts and then a question. One is, well, not really thoughts, just suggestions. One is, uh, Many adults don't understand the process of grief. When you talk about grief, it's like, what is grief? I didn't know what grief was until I went to social work school. <laughs> so um, just a recommendation, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, <laughs> read the little tiny book that she wrote on grief. What's the name of it? On grief or something? Yeah. On dying. Yeah, it's not about dying. It's about all kinds of grief. Um, secondly, uh, back to the idea of optimism in children. Um, Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania uh, is a psych famous psychologist who's been studying happiness and optimism. There's a book called The Optimistic Child, which is not about foreign service or uh, overseas life, but it's uh, exactly on, on target when you talk about how to get your child to be more optimistic. Um, he's also written books for adults about optimism and resilience. Um, thirdly is my question, and that is, um, we talk about red flags. And actually, I have a comment about this too, but we talk about red flags. Uh, what does red flag mean? Um, I just want to remind everybody who's here, who's in some kind of foreign services, that we do have regional psychiatrists who uh, one should not be afraid to go see and who are very helpful with dealing with issues related to children who can arrange medevacs if you're not in a place where your child can be tested. And I encourage everybody to use those. Um, my question is, what is a red flag and what does one do about it when you're in a country uh, where there is very little mental health care? And uh, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Red flags can be all kinds of things. And in the kinds of kids that I've worked with, and mind you, I work with both private sector and foreign service kids, so um, I want to make sure that I don't say anything that would enable anybody to identify any child that I've ever worked with. But in generalizing, the red flags sometimes are really hard to find. Because they're, especially when we think about so many of the kids that we know that grow up in this lifestyle, so many of the kids that we know are very polished. They, they, uh, they present well, they interact with adults well, they are very sociable, they're poised, they're educated, they're sophisticated, they look great. But that doesn't mean that what's happening inside is also great. So the red flag is really, really hard to find. And I think that could be the topic of an all-day seminar. You know, how do we know this? And so some of the kids that I've seen, on the outside, everything was great. 
And then something dramatic and dreadful happened, and nobody saw it coming. I think that, you know, it's one of the things that I'm really aware of and thinking about when I'm listening to a story is signs of depression and anxiety. It can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Um, I see a lot of cases of kids with ADHD where it really is, the distraction is not really the ADHD, it's the depression and anxiety. And so there are a lot of misdiagnoses with people who are too fast, too quick, who don't pay enough attention. Um, and then there are the people who overtly get your attention with the red flag. So those are the kids who are into substances and who are openly defiant and who are, their grades are falling off the, the edge of the cliff. And, you know, those are the kids that are actually kind of easier to deal with because they're doing something to get our attention. And so that, that's an easy one. It's the ones who aren't telling us what's going on that are a puzzle. So that red flag is hard. It's hard to define. I, I, I would add that um, it, with middle school students in particular, um, you've known your child. You've known how they've adjusted to, to schools in the past. Um, I, I've, I've had parents, and I had personal experience with my own children, with one of my own ch children, who was suddenly had insomnia. Um, and sort of showed more anxiety than ever before and, and spent, um, there was a little regression, a little bit of um, looking, separation anxiety for the first time ever, a child who was able to cruise around the city of Beirut without even thinking twice, was suddenly in a very peaceful, quiet environment and yet um, was showed a lot of anxiety, um, started becoming very um, uh, particular about the way things needed to be. So there was a, certainly a lack of control issue there, I, I think. Um, but the anxiety and the separation anxiety, which was not particularly developmentally appropriate, nor was it um, nor was it familiar to, to that child. Stomach aches. Stomach aches and headaches, you get a lot of that. Children who come to school and, and the, same, the same things that they experienced in kindergarten, <laughs> they're experiencing, you know, you always have the kindergarten kids sort of in fetal position or, or you know, they can't make it through till lunch or they're acting out on the playground. We see a lot of that with middle school and even high school kids suddenly that, that, that was not there in the past. And I think another, oh, I've lost, I've lost. I think, I think for me, um, a more striking example within, within older kids is that a lot of times in a, in a new school, there's a power dynamic going on with, with the kids who have been there, and your child's coming into the power dynamic. And I don't often find kids who have had multiple transitions immediate players in the power dynamic. They often are bystanders or they're in the backgrounds of that. And so it'll be strange things like, drawing attention, drawing um, negative bullying, drawing negative attention to themselves, not necessarily from teachers, because remember these are often pleasers, um, but often from other kids that, that they're, they're drawing negative behavior to themselves. A sixth, a sixth grader picking on a senior for no apparent intelligent reason. Um, <laughs> So, so those would be red flags to me. Some are personal and experienced by the family. They, they see changes in behavior at home, and some just not appropriate at school that are worth looking at maybe a little more deeply. I just, I just would like to add something quickly. On We just came from a conference, Families in Global Transition, and many of us attended a session that was very powerful about a girl with an eating disorder who came out of a very successful family. And it was happening under their very noses for a very long time. And it was a mother's testimonial of what her journey was and their story was with their daughter. And you know, the frightening thing about it is that they had no idea. And this is a very loving, supportive family. They had no idea that it was going on. And so it, it, I just wanted to throw that out there, eating disorders are the kind of thing that our kids would be extremely vulnerable to, and you would never know until something happens. I just want to make a quick comment. First, I wanted to thank the first uh, speaker.
speaker for actually verifying what we're trying to say. It was a wonderful experience uh, in, in that environment. And then when I came back, was what made it so difficult, because you come back as a hidden immigrant. And that's a risk factor, because when I came back, I looked like everybody else. And so then they expected me to be like everybody else, and I had no clue who Elvis was or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but that can be a risk factor, by the way, and a red flag, even when you go, if you go to a country where your kids look like the host culture, often they'll wind up either becoming chameleons and trying to disown part of themselves, or they become screamers. I'm not like you, I'll make sure I do something not like you, or just wallflowers. Um, so that's another pattern you can see, and I think I I became depressed at home or quiet and, and angry and things like that, but my parents didn't have language in that year. What happened to this person who used to be kind of friendly and everything else, and all of a sudden she, you know, busted at everybody, and that was in 13. But the other thing we haven't even mentioned is how many kids I've talked to have been sexually abused, and that is a risk factor that is a factor in life around the world. And I think sometimes when we're in communities like we are, we assume it can't happen from anybody in our community because we know them all. Or it can happen in some cultures. People can be abused within the culture. I'm just putting that out as far as the fact it's a reality that spending 25 years listening to the story, I have been absolutely dumbfounded at the stories because when I grew up, I never thought about that. It just, when I raised my kids, it wasn't a part of my thinking. But, you know, for different reasons, if you have any signs, maybe your kid's afraid to go over to that person or something that would just be, again, normal life happens even though it's <coughs> uh, That's just a place to think about that it, your children are not invulnerable. So you want to be teaching protection there as you do anyplace else. Okay. Um, I was just going to suggest because we're already a little past the time, but if our panelists have time for a few more questions, if you'd like to ask a question, it might save time just to get up and stand in line, and we'll take maybe, you know, three or four we'll short, 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 uh, a couple of things. I'm also an integrative art mm -hmm. therapist, and one thing I find from the therapy community, they're so misinformed about DCKs and they're so easily misdiagnosed. So I think trying to educate therapists and counselors in the states, and but also in the states, is so crucial. The other thing that wasn't addressed, and I'll just throw it out. I'm writing a book about it right now. Is when the mother, like me, is from yeah. another culture than America. And, and, and that adds another dimension to the struggle about for identity for for the kids. So I think that's also something that we haven't really discussed in the foreign service community. And I'll, I'll let you talk. I have lots of ideas about that. I would call it the growing cultural complexity. And uh, we need to start looking and applying lessons we've learned in the strict TCK models and some of these other things. If you look at President Obama, he is not only an official TCK, he's bicultural, he's biracial, he went to school in a different language, he's domestic TCK, and he's minority. And when you put those six ways kids can grow up cross culturally all in the same person, we have a whole other discussion for the next <laughs> That's a good question. That's a great question. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sam Charles, I'm director of ECS consultation service here and a couple things I was wondering but first of all I want to thank you I was thinking how fortunate that we are to have your experience and your willingness to understand uh, since I, I got here about eight years ago we've worked with literally thousands of kids we manage 1600 kids who have uh, learning disabilities very, very mild child sexual incidences that occur, and they are real and they do occur, but we try to be very sensitive with them and to uh, do the best that we can. Uh, here's my question. First of all, I think that adjustment is a process and not an event. 
doesn't happen. You know, uh, I just got back from Haiti after an on-site visit there, and I was struck with how difficult it could be because people go to work and they go home. <laughs> They're in the compound and they don't go out. And I visited the school, and the school is fine. Uh, the teachers there are wonderful and they want to help children. But kids live an hour away. So he, here's my question You're a parent, and you're going to Haiti, and you know how tough it is. How do you tell a four year old, an eight year old, and a 16 year old? I've, I've had lots of experience with this. <laughs> For me, it was easy talking to my own children. I just have two, uh, and they've been on the move. Or they were not even born in the U.S. Um, that was much easier to tell them about the reality of life. What was hard for us was when I would overhear them say things like, Oh, Grandma, the guy with the machine gun on the school bus. So for me, it wasn't my actual children. It was the extended family that we had to convince that we were making choices that were driven on what was in the best interest of our family and what we were choosing to do. And um, you know, the kids that are under your umbrella right there with you, as parents, you can sell them almost anything. It's those extended family members that are hard for me. I would say it's something a little different. <laughs> and that is that I think to have an honest discussion as a family that would be developmentally appropriate. So you treat the six-year-old different from the eight-year-old from the 16-year-old in the amount of information that they can process. But I think the important thing for them to understand is that no matter what, they're going to be safe. And that the family is a safe place and that the home is going to be a safe place and that in this world, the you know again, we're a foreign service audience. The embassy is going to do everything they can to keep us safe, and that if things are ever not safe, we will leave. Um, and that there is a system in place actually for leaving when things are no longer safe. So that you know that fundamental the feeling of emotional safety is still going to be there with the kids, and that we'll have some challenges, we'll have some fun. You know, I also talk to parents about upcoming transitions, you know, even visualizing where do you want to be at the end, and then how are we going to get there? So what are some of the things that we can do? What are going to be some of the things that are going to be tough? And what are some of the things that are going to be fun? And what's our roadmap? So that you be thinking about it before you're in the crisis moment. And I think that goes for almost any adjustment. Thank you. I just have one other final question. I was sitting here thinking, can you tell me why I have a fork in my pocket? <laughs> Before the next question, if I could just say something really quickly, because I know people have to get back to the office and we'll be losing people little by little. But um, the Foreign Service Journal was so kind to um, ask me a year ago to write this article, Protecting Your Child's Emotional Health. and I interviewed each of these people to write the article, and it's out of this article because I had the benefit of talking to my friends that I said we have to tell more people and more people have to have a conversation than just us on Skype. So anyway, um, this article was published last June, and Ed Miltenberger just went and made sure that everyone here has a copy. I don't know if it's a photocopy or the original journal, but it's the one that has Latin America and the U.S. finding the right fit. Um, that's the one you can all take. And then, and then, okay. And then over on the table, um, there are samples of books that you might want to order from Amazon. Ruth's book, um, Third Culture Kids Growing Up Among Worlds, is the one that I have at home, earmarked and highlighted and falling apart. And I just said, how did she know my family? She was inside watching all this time, and I had no idea. Anyway, she doesn't have it for sale, and we want to always remember David Pollack. I know he's with us today in spirit, and um, her other book is for sale. The others, um, your book is on Amazon. I just saw a new book called Teens Talk at the conference, and I bought a copy. There, it's on the table for you to look at. You can order that online. And then just assorted other things, including some of us have business cards. <coughs> It's kind of, you can take everything except for the books, and you can buy her book. And that's all I have to say.
ready for right, questions. We'll just do these last two questions. <laughs> and I just want to say that everybody, you can also get those articles online. Um, the Foreign Service Journal is online and that issue. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Siddhartha Kushman Shah. And uh, I'm a physician and public health scientist really interested in resiliency. And uh, recently I've been working with USAID to train and educate people before deployment to even think about these subjects. And something I really uh, value and honor different points that have come up. I've heard our people's situation uh, in each of your remarks. The one that I wanted to hear more about was the co-parenting uh, process, especially when one parent is local with the kids and one is not. Um, we heard it <coughs> there an eating disorder was uh, uncovered and uh, there was so much distress in the parent that wasn't local and how that parent can feel engaged. So this is not as a question about TCK as much as it is about the parent having as solid a response as possible, feeling almost, in his words, uh, like I'm useless over here. Uh, and, and if you could speak a little bit to that situation about how, and of course it's developmentally dependent, but if you could have some general remarks about how that parent can show up. I think it was, especially with any of the, these issues that we had see in our kids, um, it's easy for us to think, well, the kid has a problem. But actually, it's taking place in the context of a family. And so that doesn't mean that parents are bad. It just means that this is a family issue. And all the contributing factors are also a family issue. And so the families really need to be involved in the treatment plan as well. So it's not just we're going to drop off the kid and get the kid fixed. But it's the whole family has to be thinking about what do we need to do in order to to change the way we do things that is going to continue give this child on um, ongoing support. So even if the employee is overseas and the, the child is back here, those families are involved in treatment and they're involved in the therapy calls and they're involved in what's going on and very much a part of what is going on. And I would say that any treatment plan that does not include the family is one that should be evaluated again for appropriateness. Do you do it by Skype? They do it, they can do it by Skype, by telephone calls, but definitely the family needs to be involved. And I would say that's one of those situations you might need to think about saying, is this working? In that kind of a crisis time, you know, and, and there are a lot of organizations that do work trying to help families find a new place to fit in the organization during those times, and I think that's where the system can itself take a place. I've seen a lot of good stories where the people, you know, the bosses and stuff have said, okay, this is the time, let's find a different slot for you so that the family can. And some places don't, and the people will make a different choice. But I would, I would reevaluate uh, if it doesn't work this way from the whole perspective and say. Although, in the Foreign Service, it's complicated too, though, because some of the best treatment in the world is available to our kids, but only if the parent is overseas, and both yeah, parents are overseas. So that creates a conundrum. You yeah. know, what's better, to come back and do this together as a family, or to stay overseas so that we can afford the treatment that we could never afford unless we win the lottery on our own. Um, so that's all part of that conversation that has to happen of what is going to be the best route in this situation. Thank you, then I've just learned something. <laughs> okay, we'll have our last question, and then there's always time. <laughs> 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 Pull it down. Pull it down. Yeah. I wanted to put interference on in that. Um, hi, I wanted to know, how can we support our children who have non-standard gender identities or gender expressions, especially in cultures that have really rigid gender roles? So if we have, you know, girls who are strong tomboys at even at a young age, or you know, spark little boys, how how can we support that when the culture may or may not accept that at all? You know, that's a very um, common dilemma that a lot of families have. I think it's hard enough when you're living in your, what you call your own home environment, to understand who the other supporting adults might be in the community. But when you then are transported over to another environment where you yourself don't even know Will this be acceptable at school? Will this be acceptable even in the community? Um, I think for me, the kids have to have the family as the buffer. And so the family has to be out there and, and um, like negotiating things in a way before 
So the child is just not set there on their own trying to figure out how they're going to uh, be the strong soccer girl when no one else does that, or how they're going to be the boy that likes to do something that the other boys don't like. So for me, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys. I boil it down to the mom or dad. we got to be there to help and support these kids. I did want to point out uh, another book that I brought to my friend. Oh, the here. Here, sorry. Okay. Yep, I, I brought from a friend, a farm service friend, who has written a book called The Hidden Immigrant. And uh, so she sent me six, which I can sell under the Amazon uh, price of $20. And uh, there's 16 if you want to buy one from me. There are only six of them. But it's a wonderful uh, looking, looking back on what it was like growing up for missionaries, farm service, military, business kids, so I think find it very interesting. Well, thank you, Patty, and I'd like to, first of all, ask everybody to join in a round of applause for our wonderful panel. <laughs> I, I'm really delighted to, you know, to hear, you know, this issue sort of addressed, at least in this group, but I'm left with a question about uh, how much it's really needed, and I hear AID is doing something. I don't know really actually what state is doing or not doing in terms of you know, offering some of these insights to parents in a more systematic way as they go overseas. So that's a question you've left me with here at AFSA, so we'll have to look into it. But thank you again, and thank you all for being here and your questions and your attention. And uh, anyone who would like to look at the materials or purchase any, please uh, step right up. Thanks. Thank you.